I won't have to go into much on, on situational awareness. Um, I've already mentioned a couple of ways as to say I use Drudge and some others that, that go out on the fringes of things. There are some woo-woo sites that are out there that are like, wow, that's interesting. Uh, but you just need to be aware, uh, as, I, as I do now when I talk to people on the phone, it's like, what did Trump bomb overnight? I don't know. We'll have to see what country he bombed last night. So that could become very important in the next couple of days as to what, what transpires. So uh, I'm kind of watching things every couple of hours, go up to certain sites and say, what's going on? Um, and uh, being, <laughs> being retired military, being in the field that I was an end user of Intel, you kind of read between the lines as to what's actually occurring there. So when they say Japan is evacuating cities, hmm, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. When they say Pyongyang, portions of Pyongyang were evacuated, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> when they do evacuations on the Korean Peninsula and South Korea, you're like, well, they're obviously planning on something. So just, uh, you know, uh, be aware of what's going on. Uh, the US news media is horrendous at reporting. Uh, they lie through their teeth. I don't trust what they're reporting, so I use other sources. And that's what you want to do is find some, what you would consider other sources uh, to get you what's, what's called open source intel, uh, since you don't have access to, to the real stuff. So that's what you're trying to do. Okay, and then if you are somewhere and something happens, protect yourself, uh, since most of you are not trained as first responders, like a firefighter, that you have hazards after an explosion or an attack or something like that. You could have any one of these hazards, and you just need to be aware of what's going on at that event. And your, your response is usually get out of that and go to a safe location. You're not making entry. You're not trying to do anything. You have no idea what else is going on. The thing that most people don't know is if it's a terrorist device, has planted a device, they typically plant secondary devices. You see this all the time in the Middle East, especially in Israel. They'll plant one device, all the first responders come in, 20 minutes later, a second device goes off, and that's what they're trying to do is killing the first responders. So just be aware of that. that but the other one did go off. Yeah, down at, uh, there was Russia, there was Russia. There was Russia, yeah, where the one, it appeared to be a suicide bomber was on the a train and he had planted another one in a fire extinguisher in another train station. So very, very common uh, for them to do that. That is, that is something that they teach in their schools is to plant secondary devices or to have a secondary bomber who's out there. So be aware of that. Yeah, I forgot that. That one was very, very current. I, I saw that. Um, earthquakes, obviously, they're common. They can occur and f the local resources will be overwhelmed. Uh, and that's why I teach CERT and that's why I encourage people who are part of a community to maybe take a look at the search and uh, we did put some flyers out. There's a search course coming up in the end of April and then May. So uh, if you're not involved, you're, you're going, you're going to go and in a group. Anybody else in your family? Because uh, the whole group. Uh, my family, I'm still trying to sell them. You're still trying to work on it. Okay. So anyway, it's uh, basically it's a Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday. And you don't have to do anything. You just take the class, and then you can say, well, I do want to help, or I just want to do this for my own personal. And we have lots of people do it. Uh, so uh, literally from teenage all the way up to I have 80-year-olds in wheelchairs who come to it. It's like, okay, we can find something for you. Uh, so you may be on your own for a little bit, so just, just be prepared for that. Pandemics. Okay. Um, and, of course, we, we had one that WHO declared due to the flu. Uh, it did not, we had some issues here with much more uh, intensity overseas in Asia and places like that that they had. But you just need to be aware that you can have a small events that start in some province in China and very, very quickly it is here at the border. People say, well, well they'll be able to quarantine them and stop them at the border. No, they have no plans for that. They're not going to do that. They're going to let everybody in. They can't control the border today, let alone when they have incidents. That's not going to happen. It's, it's going to be here. And it'll come in through Los Angeles, Las Vegas. It'll come in from a West Coast port. And that, that's where you'll have all the issues from Asia come in. So you just have to figure out what's going on, what do they think is happening. Uh, Ebola was a great one where you saw uh, the CDC, and I teach healthcare workers uh, for a living. You saw the CDC tell the people in the hospital, for example, down in Houston, oh, you can wear one of these gowns and an N95, and you're good to go with Ebola. Horse pucky. Then when you saw the real responders at the very specialized hospitals have the Ebola suits and the pappers on, you're like, wait a minute here. These guys actually know what they're doing. 
The CDC had to revise that after those nurses became critically ill and say, ah, no, this isn't effective. Don't wear these, wear the other suits. So if it is an aggressive type of biological agent, which is what Ebola is, uh, you need to have something that's going to protect you completely, not, not this little thing that's meant for TB and, you know, little pukey kids and stuff. So be aware, watch what the responders are wearing. And the real responders were wearing this stuff. The sacrificial nurses were wearing this stuff. And that's exactly what they were. Yeah, not good. Okay. All right. Two guesses on what we think we have here. So if you see that, that would be a very, very bad day because smallpox was supposed to have been eliminated like 20 years ago. Um, so we should not see any cases of smallpox out there. However, uh, given an event, you may need to rapidly uh, isolate the sick people from the not sick people and then quarantine those that may have come in contact but aren't showing any symptoms. You isolate these people who are sick, you're in a special room, you have special procedures, and then they quarantine the other people. And we even saw problems with this, of course, in the Ebola, where nurses usually were coming back uh, into the States, they had been overseas, and they had uh, volunteered, been there two weeks, a month, whatever it was, and they came back and they said, well, you know what, it may take up to two weeks or more for Ebola to manifest in you. We want you to self-quarantine at home. The vast majority of them said, I completely understand, not a problem. In most cases, the State Department of Health, County Health, said, okay, that's great. Uh, here's what we want you to do. You stay at home, your husband, whatever, will provide you food and everything. We want you to take your temperature once or twice a day on a video conference link with a Department of Health nurse. And uh, you take your temperature, you show them, we talk to you, everything's good, you're fine. You don't have to come in, we don't have to go see you. It's on a video chat link, if you will. Uh, that worked well, except for the one that was in the East Coast who said, no, I want to ride my bike all around town and stuff, and that, that caused issues. It was, just, it was just wrong. It's like, no, you should be smarter than that. Uh, when they ask you to quarantine, you should be able to self-quarantine. So, well, we had two from St. George who, uh, who, who came back. Who came back. The health department put them on a quarantine right. in the motel room, but people think, well, it's not here. No, no, it is. It is, yeah. yeah. Now, they, they, they were non-symptomatic their whole time. Right, right. And that's what most, uh, most of the health departments will say, yeah, well, you could do it at home. We could, we could provide you something. And, you know, most healthcare professionals will say, I completely understand. I want to protect my community, my family, whatever it is. That one was just like, what is wrong with you? You know, you just have to ask, what, all this training you've had and you just want to ride your bike around New Hampshire, wherever you were? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's not right. <laughs> Okay, um, just some different things that are out there. These are some of the uh, potential biological agents. This course does not get into detail. Uh, this, is, this is another course uh, that we teach that's just for healthcare people that, that goes into all this stuff. Um, and we're just showing you just for people who, who haven't seen things, okay? This is a, a bubo uh, from, from plague. Uh, and then this would be cutaneous anthrax uh, which they did see after the anthrax attacks uh, on very, very few people, but it did show up. It, it, it is here, it's endemic, uh, it, otherwise known as uh, wool sorters, disease, things like that. So the local healthcare people have probably seen cutaneous anthrax uh, without a problem because it's, it's out there with sheep and cattle and things. How do you prepare your shelter? And basically pandemics can start very quickly. Uh, they usually come from some region uh, less developed and they will come here. Um, like they have in Africa or Asia or whatever, uh, but you need to have acquired your own PPE. So if you don't have this stuff stockpiled, they're going to run out, even hospitals will run out very, very quickly of this. And that's one of the things that they found out is they did not have enough stockpiled because they realized how much they were going through the hospital in, in Houston. I'm trying to think how much they said they generated of contaminated waste. And it was like 10, 55 gallon drums a day of hazardous waste that they were generating. And then they had to find a has waste person that would transport and legally ship it. They had to get special permission. So they were just literally stockpiling it on site because they didn't, the company who normally did their has waste said, I can't take that because it's in a special category. They had to get special permission from the state to take this. Usually then they take the has waste to an incinerator and it's burned is what happens. So you need to acquire your own stuff because thinking, I'll just go to Walmart if I need to. Walmart's gone, Walgreens, all the places, gone, gone, gone. And this stuff is, is all, almost all the PPE is made 
in China or somewhere in Indonesia or somewhere. And so it literally comes over by slow boat in uh, great big cargo containers. And so they have what they have, and then, it, then they're done, and you'll wait. So you want to you make sure that you have enough to cover you and your family. Uh, you may want to set up two rooms in the house, one for sick people, one for non-sick people, and that's your sick room. Um, and that way you're, you're not passing the illness back and forth. These are general characteristics of biological agents. Most, the, probably the most important thing is that it usually takes at least 48 to 72 hours to show symptoms in that patient, whether that's flu, whether it's almost anything, which is why they don't know. And a lot of times you initially show as a flu-like patient and they have a slight temperature, they're just feeling not good, they don't know what it is. And even the anthrax patients, that's how they initially reported, is flu-like symptoms, went to the doc in the box, the doc in the box said, uh, it looks like flu, although it's summertime, we don't know. Guy went home, he basically advised him to take two Tylenol, we'll see you in the morning, and he died six hours later. And they were like, wow, <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen. You're not supposed to die of the flu. And if they would have done a chest x-ray, they would have seen, uh, <laughs> they would have seen what his lungs looked like, which were not good. So uh, different things that uh, can happen. Basically, it multiplies and overcomes the body's immune system is what most of them do. Okay, uh, this is what can generally protect you what are referred to as bloodborne pathogens. So you want to have your, your gloves, your mask, your suit, whatever you're using, and be able to decon. So as you come out of the room, you're basically, then you use your bleach wipes or you use a little one gallon spray container which has bleach on your suit, not on your skin to decontaminate. Garden sprayers work really well when appropriately mixed with bleach. The ratio is about one to 10. You could go a little bit higher, you know, so you have, uh, 10 parts water, one part bleach. Uh, I would, I go a little bit higher. I go two parts bleach uh, to, you know, 10 like that. So I make it a little, little bit higher solution. Setting up a, six, a sick room, the bedroom should be the furthest one uh, away. It should have its own bathroom attached to it. That's really good. So you're not moving contaminated body fluids out of that room. You're just going from the bedroom to the bathroom and you're dumping it there in the toilet. Uh, you need to, anybody going in, it is an N95. You, you should be deconned as you come out, either using bleach uh, or bleach wipes. Don't use bleach on skin. Uh, and then you're wiping your skin off with alcohol wipes afterwards, baby wipes, something like that to get your skin clean. Then taking a shower is what I would do. Okay. Um, they, they make, they don't make, you would, you would have to construct a very simple, what I would call a vestibule outside of that room. So you have a doorway leading into that bedroom that you're gonna use, and you basically are establishing or you're building a very small vestibule, like two foot by two foot uh, in the hallway, so that it has plastic. Where did my, um, oops, I'm just gonna show you this for a second. Where we did this, we were training in a hospital. This is actually in a hospital, but it's the same thing. Uh, and it, you have plastic and you're using PVC. Okay, here we are. And basically you see the entryway and then we have two sheets of plastic and then they can move them to go in. And what you're trying to do is control the air so it stays inside of that uh, room that you're dealing with. Um, and that's what, that's what you're trying to do. When they're treating the patient, um, you know, this is how, and these are, these are pappers uh, that they were using there. So we were training them how to, how to suit up, how to train patients, things like that. But you're using plastic, polyethylene, whatever, uh, to uh, on this little PVC, uh, you know, about this big by this big, and you're having basically plastic on it, and then it's slit down so you go in. So you keep an area in there, and that becomes your little clean place where you go and you can hang your, your suit up. So when you go in, you suit up, and then you go into the bedroom, which has a thing of plastic there. So there's plastic going into the bedroom, there's plastic going into the hallway, and you have a little dead zone. It's what you're trying to do is create there. And you keep all your stuff in there, you can decon yourself. And of course, you're limiting the amount of people that go in there. Um, some other considerations. The mattress should have a zippered plastic cover on it that you can wipe off because the person will have issues. 
Uh, try to use a single bed versus a queen or a king. So when you're providing care, you're only leaning so far over the patient. You don't have a huge bed. Um, obviously, a number of pillows to make them comfortable. Plastic pillow covers. Uh, make sure you have lots and lots of sheets because you may be going through two sheets a day on that patient depending on what's going on. So you're going to need lots of stuff. You probably end up doing laundry. Probably going to use bleach in, in whatever. You know, this is where white sheets, white stuff works well because you're putting bleach in when you're doing the laundry to kill anything that's there. Side rails are a consideration uh, to put on the bed so the patient doesn't roll out because sometimes they are not all there. Um, uh, make sure you have plenty of towels, washcloths. I, I use a lot of disposable stuff. Uh, you can... You know, it, technically when you have hazardous waste, biological waste, you should use the red bags. Um, they're easy to purchase over the internet and all they do is help you distinguish between what is contaminated and what is normal trash. Um, good luck getting rid of this, uh, but anyway, that's, that's one way to do it. So, <laughs> you, you, I don't think they'll take that in the normal landfill here would be my, would be my guess. No, but it works well in the brown. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. I would not recommend it. I would not recommend it. I, I've never heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no off-label use, right. Okay, so uh, you're going to want a disposable plastic basin, emesis basin, things like that. Anything that can be easily deconned or this is terrible, boom, you can throw it away. All that stuff is easy to obtain. Um, hospital gowns work well. Uh, scrubs, because the patient is going to have something on. They're going to sweat. They're going to have issues. And so you need something, a gown that's easy to take on, put off for the person because they're going to get contaminated and, and as my wife say, icky. So you're going to want to do something with them. Uh, lots of baby shampoo works really, really well. Even if you put it in in a basin and you're washing your patient with that baby shampoo in one of, one of uh, not, not the bleach one, one of the other ones or a washcloth or whatever because they're not going to get up and take a shower. Uh, so body wash, talcum powder, anything to make them comfortable. Um, what's a really, uh, the last thing is, uh, is to, to have a notebook and basically you're keeping track of a uh, patient, you know, eight o'clock woke up, uh, temperature was, uh, you know, 102, uh, sweating profusely, uh, not conscious, vomiting, da 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 you know, next day, patient getting worse, you know, temperature now 106. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, make reservations because this one's not gonna be around very long, longer and you hope you can bring it back down or patient recovering, temperature now 100, 100 uh, patient feeling better, slightly nauseous. And so you're kind of tracking it, looking at it daily is, is what's going on. Even if you're not a healthcare professional because you may get lucky enough that there's a healthcare professional in your area or you're able to contact somebody on the internet or the phone and say, here's, and they're gonna say, what's, uh, give me some history on this patient. Oh, it's a 52 year old male, da 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 you know, and, and what's his status the last three days? What's he doing? He's doing this, he's doing this, he's doing this. Okay, it looks like he's getting worse, looks like he's getting better. Here's what I might suggest, do this, do this, do this. But if you don't have these notes, you have nothing to go on. So take, take notes, you know, temperature a couple times a day, status of the patient, uh, you know, and just uh, vomiting, uh, ex extreme diarrhea, whatever it is. And so that's what you're trying to, trying to do is keep track of some of that basic stuff so that you, even though you may not be able to interpret anything, you may be able to find somebody who can help you interpret this and say, here's what I, here's what I might think you want to do. Okay, do. Medications. Uh, keep a standard supply OTC over the counter, you know, just Walmart, Walgreens stuff, uh, because they do different things. And so make sure you have anti diarrhea stuff, meclizine for nausea, vomiting, things like that. Meclizine is an over the counter type thing. Sometimes harder to find. You can get it at Walmart. You just go in there and say, uh, I'd like a bottle of mex meclizine. And they're, they're like $4 a bottle. You can get them at Costco also. Uh, Anti-diarrhea is fairly, fairly easy, but you want some of that stuff to have around. Your main goal, and this is what they found in Ebola, is there was no treatment for Ebola. The main thing was keep the patient hydrated, and that's what they had to do for an extended period of time, almost like two weeks. They had to keep the patient, patient hydrated, and they were using uh, what's typically called uh, ORS, um, which is oral rehydration salts or solution. And you can buy them prepackaged like this. There's only one company in the U.S. that sells it, and that's the name of the company right there. And they sell it by a case of, I think it's like 100. Uh, and it's like $75 or something. They keep forever. Um, or uh, your Gatorade, Pedialyte, any of these things, uh, solutions pre-made uh, that you want to have. But you want to have some stuff there. 
You're not giving them soda pop. You're not, no orange juice, none of that stuff. It's, it's either ORS or Pedialyte Gatorade, and I always cut Gatorade 50-50 with water because the Gatorade is just, it's too heavy of a syrup for them, and I get much better results using Gatorade cut 50-50. So that's what you want to do. Go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> I, I have I have the tablets too. Um, now make sure are you using salt tablets? Take a look at the ingredients in those tablets. Um, I would be careful if it's if it's exclusively salt, because the ORS is a mixture of some type of sugar that's in there and a salt. And, and then I have to look. There's one other chemical that's in there. I forget what it is. And so um, look at the ingredients on these. Is it sodium chloride, potassium chloride, trisodium citrate, and then the glucose, which is the salt. And you can see the relationship between them as to how much. So it's actually a lot of sugar. See, you see the sugar. But you need that uh, in, the, in your body to keep them alive. And so that's why we'll be careful with just salt tabs. Um, so take a look at what you have. You can also just go up on the Internet and say uh, ORS solution, and it'll come back. With a bunch of them, go to go to a, you know a, a site that you trust. Take a look at a couple, and they should all be about the same uh, to make sure that you're getting the right uh, ingredients in your solution. You can make it yourself; um, that's not a problem. You got the right, right? You have the recipe. I have the recipe too. Uh, I find that these are easier in an emergency to use. Boom! Rip it open. Liter of water. Done. I don't have to. I don't have to mix. I don't have to do anything. I, and these are going to last me forever. So. As I say, there's only one company that has those, and that's them. Um, and these, this, that's the manufacturer. Everybody else resells their product at a, at a slight profit. So uh, they're, they're pretty good. But the, I keep Pedialyte around, too, uh, and Gatorade and things like that. Uh, so you know, that's the quick stuff. That's the longer-term stuff. Uh, and then if you are on medication, uh, heart medication, whatever you're on, just work with your doctor and say, you know, I'm concerned about a supply disruption that could be caused by any number of things. Uh, I would like to acquire a 90-day supply. Uh, and you're just kind of working with your doctor to, to see what, if he'll say, okay, I can see we could have a supply disruption, uh, as long as it's not like, you know, a class 3 narcotic or something. He would probably say, okay, uh, yeah, uh, you need more heart meds, you need more whatever kind of meds. Um, many of them understand that, and they, and they might work with you on that. Chemical events. The, the thing with chemical events is usually you are – in an area where a chemical has been released, that chemical is normally released as a, as a very fine mist, uh, as a liquid, and it vaporizes very quickly. And then you, although you can get it on your skin, usually uh, you inhale it, and it goes through your respiratory tract. Um, and so you want to protect yourself there. So on some of the things, like a nerve agent, uh, the onset is very, very quick. Uh, it's uh, generally for a nerve agent, about 10 seconds if it's the right uh, ingredients, uh, and you're dead. So if you ever want to see how that works, I have a nice little videotape of when they tested it with monkeys, and it kills the monkeys. 10 seconds, the monkey is dead. Uh, so that's how effective a real nerve agent is, very, very quick. Uh, the one that they used on uh, King Jong-il's brother-in-law, half-brother, whatever he was, they used VX, which is a non, which is a persistent agent, but it's not normally released as a vapor. It, is, it is a, has a consistency of mineral oil. And from the videotapes where they killed him in the Malaysian airport, it almost appears that the woman comes up behind him, puts something over his, his head, almost like a bag that must have had the, the chemical inside of it, and it gets it on his face, and then you see him kind of wandering around. If he would have simply used a baby wipe and gotten it off his skin, he probably would have lived. But he stood there, and he was alive, they said, for 20 minutes, which is about how long it takes to go through the skin. Uh, but if he would have gotten, gone into the bathroom and used soap and water and gotten it off of him, he probably would have lived. But he didn't. And by the time they got him to a medical aid station in the airport, they are like, what's the problem? And they probably didn't do a whole lot, and he died right there. So the, the key on that, the takeaway is, Anything you get on you that you have no idea what it is, get it off of you as quickly as possible. If that involves taking your shirt off and wiping it, do that. Get it off your skin immediately. Do not let it go in because some of the stuff is dermal, gets on the skin, penetrates the skin, but it takes some time. If, it's, if it is a gas, you're going to inhale it, and it's going to be very, very quick. But the VX that they used is not 
uh, in aerosol. It is applied as a, as, a, as a liquid, normally, as I say, consistency of mineral oil, and uh, <laughs> went right through the skin, but took 20 minutes to kill them. So not good. This is the normal way that the nerve agents and those things kill. They can kill other ways. This is how the VX killed by absorption. Uh, don't ever drive through a cloud that you have no idea what's in that cloud. Um, that's how people get killed also. So uh, you want to be careful there. Basically, you are always going up, up, and away from whatever agent that's out there. And the way I try to teach people to remember that is you're going to be Superman at this point, and you are, you are going uphill, upwind, and away from that. Never downwind, never downhill from whatever has been released. If something's been released, you want to get out of there and go up, up, and away is what you want to do usually 90 degrees to, uh, to that, not, not downwind at all, go 90 degrees to it. Chemical agents, usually a liquid. Uh, normally it will be a very fine mist or a gas, and it has a lot of effect by weather. Sun, heat of day, winds and things will greatly affect a chemical release. Uh, if they know what they're doing, they normally will release a chemical weapon at like five in the morning. Uh, basically you have no heat, you have no uh, wind, Wind is very low, humidity is very low, and that's when it'll sit there as a cloud, just like fog does. That's essentially what it is. And then, and then it won't move. It'll just kind of sit there and float, and it'll kill the maximum number of people. The worst time to release it would be the heat of the day, 12 noon. The winds are high, the heat is high, the sun is out there, and it dissipates it very quickly. So if you want to leave no evidence of it, that's the other time is you release it in the middle of the day. It kills the people in 90 seconds, Two minutes later, it's gone. It is uh, basically evaporated and it's gone. You can be protected if you have the proper mask and things like that. That's why it's very, very important to get the mask on very quick. And an N95 does not provide protection. You can have, if the, if the, the gas was released here, you can clearly have a downwind plume that goes off. The wind is here, it's blowing it that way. And you can have different levels of concentration. This just shows, for example, 60 parts per million right here where it was released. The next circle, 20 parts per million, and out here, seven parts, and then you just keep dropping down as it gets out here. But this could easily be from here. If this was 60, this could be, still be 60 here where the wind is blowing it this way. So that's why you do not want to be downhill, downwind. You want to be uphill. You're going uh, um, against it. So uphill, upwind, get away from wherever it is. Some of the pr uh, primary indicators of an NBC attack. Uh, lots of victims, mass casualties, they're all down, uh, a device is there, something that smells unusual, but be careful with the smells. Anything that just uh, has an unusual odor, chemical, petroleum, anything that just doesn't belong. Dead animals, kind of a giveaway, all of the animals in the area are dying, that's not good. Or warning or credit, like some of the groups do, will we'll give warning or credit and say, that was us, we'll be back again, okay, good. Uh, the animals seem to be more frail than the humans. They are. They're closer to the ground, have a smaller system, and it takes a less PPM to kill them, just like children. And that's the key with children is you are six foot tall. Your child stands here. The cloud, like a fog, is hanging close to the ground. They get a higher concentration at the ground, which is why children are quicker to be affected, and they're also affected by less of a concentration. So, um, you know, you see a cloud coming at you, pick the child up and get it to your elevation, and you've, you've cut it probably in half right there. Just by, just by moving them from this height to this height because the cloud is going to, just like fog, you can see it roll on the ground about three foot high. That's, that's the kid, that's the dog, that's the cat right there. Higher concentration. Uh, these are things and we have seen, for example, um, you know, terrorists in the Middle East use chlorine all the time to kill people. Use it on a regular basis in Syria, uh, different parts of the Middle East. They love chlorine because it's available. It comes in one ton cylinders. Uh, chlorine can be a solid, can be a liquid or a gas. They use it as a gas, uh, and this is what you get uh, near, near the event, kills the people, then it goes out, and you just see them choking, gasping, things like that. Get, get out of the area as quick as possible. Blood agents, what they do is they affect the blood in the blood's ability to take oxygen to the vital organs is what they do. Hydrogen cyanide. Uh, and, and different types of cyanide. Basically, remember, we use cyanide. That's what they use in the, the chambers when you have a, a legal, you're killing someone, you know, because he committed murder or whatever he did. So in the gas chambers, typically use cyanide. Very, very quick. Works almost as quick as a nerve agent. Can kill you 10, 15 seconds. 
Nerve agents, different types. Um, the, the G's um, indicate that uh, basically the Germans made these agents during World War II. Uh, German agent A, German agent B, German agent D, and then VX. Um, these are very low persistency, uh, non-persistent. They evaporate very quickly. Uh, VX uh, takes many, many days to go away. Uh, normally, you inhale it, but it can get on your skin like, like they demonstrated, uh, and he died. The key on that is the pinpointing of the pupils. That's known as meiosis, and that will occur at very, very low dosage. Uh, of, uh, of any type of nerve agent or an organophosphate. Uh, what I point out is if you have ever used a wasp or hornet spray on wasp or hornets and you spray and you watch them come out of the nest and what do they do? They drop to the ground, they twitch, and they die. That is a nerve agent. That's exactly what will happen to you in a larger concentration of wasp. Well, waspers or wasp spray will typically not do that to a human except in a larger concentration. We do not suggest it is not a defensive spray. So wasp or hornet spray should be used according to label directions on wasp or hornets, not people. So, uh, but it will, uh, to get rid of it, flush water, uh, bleach on, on hard surfaces, uh, baby shampoo on, the, on people. So that's what we suggest, no bleach on people. These are some of the symptoms. They use the acronym dumbbells. Um, if you're wondering who these people are, those are Kurds. That is who, uh, basically Saddam Hussein, they were a pain in the ass to Saddam. He decided to kill them on a number of occasions using nerve agent that he sprayed from his uh, aircraft. And you can see they, they died with their eyes open running away. Kills very, very quickly. So when you see patients that die with eyes open, pinpointed pupils, <laughs> that's the only, the only thing in the world to do that. Oh, that's a nerve agent right there. <laughs> you call it whatever you want, that's a nerve agent. So, and that's what you saw in some of the Syrian when they showed the people. It's like pinpointed pupils, uh, that's kind of a dead giveaway here. You can call it whatever you want to call it, but that's a nerve agent. So they, and it only doesn't come from chlorine, doesn't come from anything else. It comes from nerve agent, that's it. A large inhalation, any type of a dose, kills quickly. And that's what it, there's actually three people here. She has a child on her back right there. And then, of course, this one probably running. She's running away. So, yeah, he killed them by the thousands. So anybody says, he didn't have any nerve agent. Horse pucky. <laughs> There's evidence galore. Up, up, the Kurds lived up, up north in, uh, in Iraq. Here's the pinpointing. And the people, the patient, if they're conscious and alert and oriented, will say, why is it so dark in here? Why? Uh, because basically the, uh, they, they lose peripheral vision is what will happen. So keep that in mind. And that's what they're complaining. Why'd you turn the lights off? It's very dark in here. I can't see. And they lose all peripheral vision because the eyes go to pinpoint. Um, this is probably the easiest way if I want to attack a large city is I simply find a rail siding and I look. No, I'll give you guys these. I don't know. Here you go. I got lots of them. These are books. Mark, you, you got these, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, the, all, all, the, that book gets updated every four years, so there's, there's 2012. They don't change very much. I've been teaching that for 30 years, very little changes. But have those. You can now identify when you see a tank car, and on the side of that tank car, it'll have a placard. It'll have a four-digit number. And you can look the number up, and it goes methyl ethyl death, whatever it is. Um, this is what they'll use when the terrorists get smart. They'll just take the piping on that car, because it's a pressurized vessel, and they'll put a pipe bomb next to it, blow it up, and they're usually not in the good parts of town. That's why it's called the other side of the tracks. So, uh, and they'll do it, uh, if they're smart, four or five in the morning. And then they'll kill thousands of people in Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, wherever they set this off, because they'll all be sleeping. And the cloud will just go over that area and will just kill people as they sleep, because they'll have no idea. They'll wake up and go, and then it'll be, boom, done, dead. And uh, that, that's how we'll do it. They'll do it with chlorine or whatever else. We don't normally ship nerve agent back and forth. So uh, it, it'll be some commercial, what's called a toxic industrial product. Nukes, okay. Um, we're going through this fairly quick, unless you guys need a break. I'm just going to go through this. Okay. Um, there's a big difference between a radiological event and a nuclear event. When you had Fukushima, Fukushima is a radiological event. It did not involve nuclear weapons or anything like that. It involved a power plant, which has high levels of radiation in the fuel rods, fuel rods being solid. And basically, they had the thing that started it off, is, of course, is the tsunami that flooded everything, turned the power off. It went to the diesel generators. The diesel generators got flooded by the water that came in. Diesel and water don't mix real well. And basically, now they couldn't cool the pond. The pond the, the, where it kept the, um, 
basically with fuel rods and evaporated the water. <laughs> fuel rods catch fire, not good. Whole place goes ba-boom. <laughs> and they had three facilities there, they all went ba-boom, not good. Um, so they had significant and continue to have significant issues over there. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's ionizing radiation, how dose does not equal dose rate, some of the terms you may hear, how do I detect it, how do I protect myself. Okay, three kinds we're really concerned about, uh, we list the neutrons here, um, alpha, beta, gamma, and neutrons. These are rays, okay, just like you get a chest x-ray. You go to chest x-ray, boom, you get a chest x-ray, boom, okay, no big deal. Uh, these are particles. Uh, typically, alpha particles uh, can go short distances, and they can be stopped with intact skin. Uh, a sheet of paper will stop an alpha particle. Beta can be stopped uh, simply. We're going to demonstrate this because I brought some small sources in. Uh, beta can be stopped with aluminum foil. So, uh, as I like to say, if you have aluminum foil hats, so the aliens can't beam in. No, the aluminum foil does work uh, for beta. It, it does do that. So there is some some theory behind that. Um, gamma, mass. You know, that's why they show the, the concrete, water can work, dirt, things like that, both, both gamma and neutrons. That's, that's the only way to protect yourself there. Ionizing radiation, let me just bring this out. Um, basically, ionizing radiation has the energy to change cells, affect cells. And that's how you get cancer. It can do lots of different things. It doesn't always cause it, but it has the potential to cause it. So if, if, uh, if it's uh, affecting uh, a living tissue, it can change that. Uh, it's not going to affect uh, you know, anything else that's non-living. It has to be living. And, and then any one of those can affect living tissue, if you will, living organisms, you know, three-headed frogs, you know, th this type of stuff. Uh, radiation can certainly do that. Um, there is a huge difference between exposure and contamination. And this uh, actually frequently gets, gets messed up. People don't understand the difference between it. So ah, I use my radioactive light sticks. No, they are not really radioactive. They are simply a, a commercial light stick. Okay? But I use this just, just to say, okay, let's see if I can get that do that. Oh, oh, perfect. Okay, that's shielding. <laughs> there we go. Okay. All right. Here's my radioactive light stick, which is this. If I walk past it, I have an external exposure. I'm being exposed to this energy for as close as I am, as long as I stay. In this case, I can actually shield it, and now I'm being less exposed to it, if you will. So, but there, I have an external ex uh, exposure to it. I have an external contamination. If I cut this open and I spray you with it, okay, you are externally contaminated with this. I'm not contaminated, she's not contaminated, I've contaminated you. The worst possible is I cut it open, you drink it. Now you are internally contaminated. Whatever uh, isotope this is uh, usually has a favorite organ that they go after. It could be bones, it could be kidneys, it could be all kinds of different things. And that's what they show here is if you get it internally, that's the worst because it will go to that organ and it will sit and will continue to irradiate that organ. That's how you get cancer and you die. So what you want to do is minimize your exposure to that radioactive material. If you get it on you, just like anything else, baby wipe, get it off of you, okay, as quickly as possible. You want to protect your respiratory tract, and for the most part, an N95 mask does a good job of protecting you from alpha and beta particles, because it's like smoke particles. Um, and so an N95 works. It is not a gas. It is a, it is a, a particulate, is actually. So that's, that's what an N95 works. When, we, when I worked at a test site and we had to go into certain areas, this is what we would wear, is this and gloves and a light suit. And it works, works well to protect you from that. So they, they work well. Which then you especially, even if, if you have nothing, put your t-shirt over your, your mouth and nose. You do not want to get whatever is out there inside of you. You want to protect yourself from that. Okay, dose versus dose rate. And this is what gets screwed up, and this is what the talking heads generally screw up on TV. Okay. So I will try to put this in in easy terms to say, okay, now I understand. All right. So just remember, dose does not equal dose rate. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say that this 
light stick has energy, it's producing energy, at a, at a rating of 10 R per hour, okay? And that's referred to as a dose rate. That's the rate that it's releasing energy. It's releasing energy at 10 R per hour. We'll go into R's in just a minute, okay? So if I stand here for an hour, my dose for that first hour is 10 R, okay? That's my, if I stand here for a second hour, my dose is cumulative, and it's now becomes 20 R is my dose, okay? So this radiation that you get is cumulative. For example, I've been a RAD worker for 30 some years for the federal government. So I have a listing every year that they send me that says, here's what you've been exposed to this year, here's your total cumulated dose that you have in your lifetime, boom, here it is. So that's documented, they know what it is because I went from Department of Defense to Department of Energy and they just transferred my records and said, you've been a RAD worker all these years, boom, here you go, and here's your, here's your record. And I still get a record, even if I have zero, it'll say, you have zero for this year, here's your accumulated dose, boom, here's what, you're, here's what it is in your lifetime um, because I'm in the system. So that's what it says. So if I stand for three hours, it just goes to 30R, okay? Now, if I am only here for a short period of time, for example, I walk past it and I don't stay there for an hour, did I get 10R? No, no. I got, you have to do a little calculation to say how long were you there, what was your distance, blah, 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 blah. And it would be like, oh, you got 100 milli R or something very, very small. You got a very, very small amount. So what you want to know is, Okay, these are nice. What's gonna kill me? What is dangerous to me? Okay, now when you get into, if, it's, if your dose is less than 50 R, it's almost negligible on your body. Your body doesn't even see it. It's like, no big deal. You're not gonna do anything, nothing. Less than 50 R is a dose, diddly squat, does nothing, okay? And then it goes, so we'll do 50 R, almost nothing, 100, and I have a slide, but I'm pretty sure it does this. Let me go. Okay. These are the units that they give. Um, we only talk, for our purposes, stuff that I like to call the big R, which is REM or RAD. Those, those terms are interchangeable for our purposes. So you start to get mild radiation sickness at about 200 REM or RAD. 200. Okay. The lethal dose is 450. So for me to get, to get 450 R, I would have to stand here for 45 hours, okay? Now, you're not, you're not gonna get that normally by doing that. You would get this quickly after a nuclear explosion because you can have, for example, you have a, a nuclear weapon that detonates in Las Vegas. At the scene, it's gonna be 2000 R per hour right there, boom, instantly, 2,000 R per hour. It's gonna obliterate the people that are there. Um, but we're concerned about fallout that comes over here to this area, because you're gonna get fallout. The winds typically blow from, uh, uh, basically they, they come from the, uh, from the west and they blow to the east, slightly north, but that's where they come, from the west to the east. And so that's where uh, a new debt, a nuclear detonation occurring in Los Angeles, or Las Vegas will affect us here. It may take eight or 10 or 12 or 15 hours to get here with a fallout, but it will affect us, much smaller numbers. And that's what we'll talk about. How do we protect ourselves from some of these numbers? Okay, you have background. For example, um, I'll just put, this is a, a nice little detector. And basically you will hear this. If I walked outside, you'd hear more. So it's chirping, okay? which means that it's picking up uh, you know, very small amounts of radioactive material or energy. If we walk outside, we'll get a little more. If I bring it over towards my sources, which are still in a sealed container, it gets a little more, okay? So there's more there. So you can say, oh, it actually works. Once I, br I bring them out, I'll show you some stuff uh, as to, as to you know, the effectiveness of really some of the shielding is what we'll do, is how do you protect yourself? Um, go ahead. The, the reports you were talking about that you did, um, how, is, how is that tracked? Is it just based on the work that you do in the exposure in those sites? 
sides, or is this like one loop or something? No, it's, it's done, what, what they call is, we, when we work in those areas at the test site, you carry what's called TLD, a thermoluminescent uh, dosimeter. And then those uh, TLDs get turned in every month. And then they get analyzed and they put it into your records. Okay. So you wear the TLD, which would clip on. You have your, you have your badge. And then you clip that, your TLD on. And then you wore it. Anytime you were on duty, you wore the TLD. And then they just got turned in every month. Uh, and then they would analyze it. And then usually once a quarter, they'd say, here's your, here's your quarterly thing. And then once a year, you got an official report. But yeah, they, they would, you'd have a TLD. You can have an old-fashioned dosimeter, which you don't see very much anymore, or dosimeters. Almost everything is TLDs uh, that they use. Much, much more accurate. Oh. These are lead line containers. These are very, very low level sources that are used for, what is this? That are used as what are called check sources. And that's what they are. They, used, they are used to check instruments. They are technically, they fall in the category of called exempt sources in that they don't require uh, a license to use them. You can actually buy them on the internet if you know what you're doing. Um, so that, that's, that's always a good thought is I can buy my own radioactive sources on the internet. Yes, you can. Um, you, just, you just have to know how to order them and stuff. So we have them because we do training to folks and uh, they come in handy. But they are considered a sealed source, although I always wear gloves when I handle them. Um, the other thing I'll just show that, that's interesting that most people are not aware of is, you know what that is? If you ever owned a Coleman lantern. No way. Oh, wait, it's off the chart. No They're sprayed with thorium, make them brighter. Most people have no idea. When you handle a lantern mantle, I would wear gloves because they're sprayed. They are. They're radioactive. They're sprayed with thorium. This is just bought at Walmart. Wow. So, yeah, most people have no idea. So, yeah. <laughs> not, not high level, but low level, but most people have no idea. So, yeah. Now, let's see. If I use my... Let's try this so we know. It takes it down a little bit, but not much. I'd have to use... I have, this is lead. So the lead does slow it down a little bit, yeah. But yeah, so just to, just to show you that there's stuff out there, people have no idea. Have you ever tested any of the stores with that? I have heard that seeds and, and things like wheat can be irradiated. Is that the same kind of thing? Um, irradi irradiated is different than the item having radioactive material. Many things are irradiated. Chicken is frequently irradiated in large quantities as it comes through to kill surface bacteria, salmonella. Very, very common. The difference is, give me one second here. Oh, that's what I wanted. Okay, this is the chicken, this is your seeds. They come through, they are irradiated, it kills something, okay? Remember, it only kills living things. It goes through the line. Has it been contaminated? No. It has been exposed. It has not been contaminated. So it doesn't take it with it. So as, it, as the chicken comes through the line, it's been exposed like an x-ray. It has killed whatever they didn't want to live there, salmonella, and it goes down the line. The chicken's dead. Chicken doesn't care. <laughs> Okay, the chicken's already dead. It's just hanging there. It's going through the line. It just kills the live salmonella that's on it. So when you say, well, well, if I eat that chicken, am I going to get radioactive material? No, no, because it's not there. It's, it's a ray that went through it like an x-ray. Okay, now, did they spray it with thorium? <laughs> well, yes, they did. Well, then, <laughs> then it's hot. <laughs> okay, but they didn't. They didn't spray it with anything that went through like an x-ray, if you will. It's actually a fairly high-level source. It's about 100 R per hour source that it gets exposed to as it goes down through the line. Yeah, just look for radiation, radiated chicken, and you'll, you'll they'll tell you how they do it. It's an FDA-approved process. There's nothing to it. Yeah. So that's your government protecting you. Yeah. Uh, but, so, but that's what they do. So that's why this is a very important slide to understand the difference is, was, was, I, were, was I exposed to uh, some type of radiation? Yes. You're exposed to radiation when you walk outside. We take this outside, this, you'll hear it go up. The sun, basically cosmic rays, gives off that too. 
sometimes uh, you have naturally occurring radioactive material, bricks, certain materials, tobacco. Are you a tobacco user, smoker? Tobacco. You had a pack of Mark? Uh, you got any cigarettes today we can use this? No, just kidding. But <laughs> if I did it as cigarettes, because cigarettes are grown in the ground, tobacco has an affinity for radioactive material. And so on one of my little charts here, I'll just show you little known facts. Okay. Uh, tobacco. This is what you're exposed to if you smoke or use tobacco, which is why when people use tobacco, do they ever get cancer? No, oh, that never happens. Yes, because <laughs> it continues to irradiate whatever it is. So tobacco is just a wonderful Water. product. <laughs> it's a wonderful Water product. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this isn't a secret. Do you think the tobacco industry knows this? Uh, probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's one of those things is like, uh, and I get a lot of people, we would teach a course to cops and firefighters, and they're like, you mean like this? And we put the meter like, wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's snuff, yeah, that'll do it, yeah, yeah. So this is what you see, you know, when you go get, uh, here's an x-ray, so 40 milliram, very, very small amount, but you just compare that, and you may get one or two x-rays a year, um, and here's your smoking, what you get from smoking, you know, a pack a day, every couple of days. So it's like, wow, building materials, these are rocks and things like that. So just, just to show you. Okay, these are, do, i do one of my little sources here. These are usually cesium. These are cesium-137. So here's my source, okay, and as you can see, I'm going to get closer to it. And it gets hotter over there. And all we're trying to say is you want to put something between, if, if you have fallout, you have a, a, a nuclear weapon or whatever is detonated in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, it's going to fall outside your house. It's going to fall like dust and debris. You're going to have to remain in the house for a couple of days. What you want to do, especially if you have children, is keep the kids inside, keep them in the furthest room away from the windows and the walls, and build something that will protect them from getting the radioactive material which has fallen as fallout because it'll be outside it's called ground shine uh, and sometimes it actually could bounce up to the sky and come back down sky shine but it, that's what you're trying to do one of the ways as you see this as it's going up to protect yourself is building walls with something and this goes to your question okay you don't have any of these do you yes okay okay so i take my I take my source and I just like, okay. All right, am I contaminating this food? No, you are not contaminating. You're not, is this food alive? Pro hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully it's sealed in nitrogen and blah, 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 blah. So using a material you already have, you build walls with this to protect not only you, but your children. So you have you know, four foot high, six foot long. This is where they sleep. Okay, something that you already have. You don't have to purchase anything. Make it too deep instead of one deep. But this is what you use to protect yourself from the outside uh, contamination. It's out on the ground, on the roof, whatever it is. That's what you're trying to do. Okay, so I use that as a good demo because most people have some of this. They'll go, oh, and then they're all afraid. Am I going to contaminate it? No, you're not going to affect it. You have to ask yourself, is the food alive? No, the food is not alive. So use this because you're not going to do it any damage. I'm not saying put this outside. This is in your house. You know, you have a wall, you have a couch. Okay, put the kids against an interior wall, and that's where they're going to sleep for a couple days because this will help protect them. It will reduce what would have been 10 is now 5 is now 2, and that's what you want. You want to reduce that level as much as you can. What are we doing? Make sure that. Sure. Sprayed with something. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Camera lens. Yeah. So I don't know what it's sprayed with. I, I'm not. This is an antique. Oh. <laughs> an antique camera lens. And in the um, 1950s when this was made, it was a very expensive lens. still ultra expensive because it collects light and allows light to go through at a much higher ratio. They did that by treating it with thorium. A store, I was going to say, I don't know what it's sprayed with. And but so, yeah, it definitely, and, it definitely and, you can and tell. This, <laughs> and this lens is famous for the yellow tint. Because that's the thorny coating. Okay. And I got that at the Catholic Church shop. Well, there you go. Two months ago. Because <laughs> you knew what it was. I knew what it was, and I also knew it was worth 
far more than the two. Dollars. Yeah, for than what they were asking for. It. Oh yeah, it's a rare collector. Yeah, item, but I don't sleep with it. <laughs> 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 very, very good. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a uh, a camera lens. I'm, I wasn't aware that they sprayed them. We have there are there are certain types of plates in China, uh, China being you know like nice plates also, and things. Also, um, Okay, so keep keep that in mind that uh, that thorium uh, could cause you some damage. So that's what you that's what you want to know there. Okay, let me go. All right, so there we go. Let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, there are different types of meters. Um, probably the most inexpensive are around a hundred dollars. It would be in this thing, similar to what I have. Um, and th all this would tell you is how much do I have out there. And it, in a given house, when the fallout comes down, it will not fall in a, in a perfect pattern. Much like snow, it may accumulate more over by the front door, but by the back door, there's not much at all or on that side of the house. And so that's the, but you, you won't know it really unless you have a meter to say, hey, it's, it's 100 over here and it's 10 over here. Put the kids over here. So that's the advantage of using a meter is that you have a much better idea of what's there because otherwise you don't know. These are not real good. These are ancient devices. Uh, these are manufactured usually in the 50s or the 60s. These are the old civil defense ones. The one thing I will point out is they put check sources on them, and this is manufactured, this is like 62 or something like that. And they say that they put a check source on it, which is on the side, and that check source is still live after 50 to 60 years. That's still an active check source even though it was put there in 1962. So older than you, and it's still still alive, yeah, so there. The people don't realize that. They're like, well, it can't possibly work. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> it still works. Um, they don't, the problem is those don't read very low levels. They're usually, they read fairly high levels. That reads, that's, a, that's like a lab instrument. It reads very low levels. So they're useful to read uh, what's out there. And so you have some idea uh, whether you're surveying a, a street, a road, or a person. So if somebody comes in after uh, they've been outside for some reason, they're coming to your shelter, you would use this to scan them to say, oh, you have, you have some here. Take off your outermost clothing, leave it outside, and then come back in. Oh, we, we missed a spot. Use a baby wipe, clean it up, throw that away, like that. So that's what these are really good for is they can detect when you bring somebody in from the outside. That's what you want to do. Keep doing this. Um, RDD, talked about it a little, uh, basically it's a dirty bomb. Uh, the most common uh, type of radioactive material that's out there are called radiopharmaceuticals. So if you go to the doctor and they want to do a test and see that your heart is functioning and everything else is good, you drink a solution, you become, you become radioactive, it goes through you, and then they can put you in a, a meter, if you will, and then they can see, oh, we can see it goes through here, pumps here, oh, we have a problem here, blah, blah, whatever it is. Those are radiopharmaceuticals. Almost every FedEx truck that ever goes to a hospital has radiopharmaceuticals. Very low level, won't kill you, but you, became, you remain radioactive for, oh, 72, 96 hours at least. And that's why they say don't sleep with your wife during that period, don't do other things uh, until it basically excretes through your normal urine, that's what they tell you. So be careful with that. Um, this is race, waste radioactive, and a pipe pump just blows it up. So. Uh, and that's all, that's all they're doing with a, with a dirty bomb is trying to contaminate an area. Okay, different from nuclear weapons. Um, low probability of use, however, would have a huge impact. Uh, there are small enough ones. This would be, you could put a, a, a 10 kiloton device in a Pelican that size. You could do that. So uh, there are such things as backpack devices. Uh, this would be more, more common. This is not the ones they put on ICBMs and launch. Um, these are terrorist type devices. Both the US and Russia made them and basically they propagated to other people. But you could do that. These would be used against Wall Street, uh, the Pentagon, the White House. They would do this, stuff like that. Okay, um, this are basic characteristics. EMP, a lot of terrible information on the internet about EMP. Um, the people who've done the tests are Department of Defense and then Department of Energy. Oh, I worked for both of them. Uh, the, the tests are actually classified as to what the actual results were. But some of the unclassed stuff that came out, they tested 
a weapon um, with cars, and they took like 100 random cars. And they said, okay, turn the cars on, park them here, do the weapon, so that it was an EMP blast, not, there was no other, it didn't blow the, blow the things over. Uh, it was like 74 of them continued to run, had no effect. 10 of them shut down, but they were able to restart it. And like only three of them had, you know, death effects that it killed the car. So it did not do what they say it will do. Oh, airplanes will fall from the sky. No. Uh, cars will stop on the freeway. No. They might stop. You restart it and you go. Sometimes it has a minimal effect. Oh, the radio didn't work. Whew, can't run now. So just, just some, some other things. It didn't affect most of the vehicles that were out there. What it will affect, and this is what, this is what they, they tend to screw up because they don't understand how things work. You have high voltage lines that run, you know, for hundreds of miles. That high voltage line in that context is an antenna. When an EMP device goes off at whatever the appropriate uh, apogee is, uh, which is classified, the, it gathers that, that wire, that line, uh, that does normally 100 megavolts or whatever it does, uh, acts as an antenna, and you have transformers at this end and at this end. Well, that transformer is designed to handle a specific voltage. What will happen is both the voltage and the amperage will be phenomenal. That comes in and is gathered by this antenna. What, what will it do with these transformers? Blow them up. It'll destroy, those, it'll destroy the transformers at both ends. That will happen. That, that's going to happen if they, if they know what they're doing. Um, that will kill, the, we have three power grids in the U.S. You have an eastern grid, western grid, and Texas. Yes, Texas has their own grid. They're that important, but that's just how it was designed. Um, and so uh, if, if an enemy is smart, and we have some fairly smart enemies, you don't have to use one huge weapon to do it over the center, because that's what they say, oh, they'll do it over Omaha. Okay, all right, fine. I'm going to take three cargo containers and I'm going to do one off the west coast, one off the east coast, one down here in, uh, in down towards Mexico. And I'm going to launch my scuds, and I'm going to take out three grids, Texas, west, and east. And I'm going to do it that way. Boom, boom, boom. And they're going to go. And so they can take out the grid if they, if they do it that way. Can North Korea do that? Uh, we suspect they can. Uh, can, I, I, can Iran do it? We suspect they can also. Uh, certainly, uh, Russia, China, yeah, they, they can do it. Israel, they can do it. Yeah, they, they, they have the, the technology to do that. But when they decide to do it, that's a very low-cost way to do it. How many people did they initially kill with those weapons? Zero. Weapon goes off in the upper atmosphere. Um, there's some pretty good estimates that say they'll kill a lot of people when you lose power grid because those transformers are, they don't stock spares for the vast majority of them, and they're built overseas and uh, take a long time to get them. So hopefully you like batteries. Yeah, there you go. So you're good. But <coughs> so you already know blast injuries, thermals. Yeah, that's uh, if you're close enough for this, you're pretty much dead. But the EMP, if you're going to talk about the best use of a weapon, where I don't have very many weapons, like Iran, North Korea, they don't have a lot of weapons like we do, is to is to do an EMP and to do it do it like that. Okay, these are taken actually at the test site. Uh, these are about 1950-something, 50 55, 58. These were above-ground tests where they hung a weapon X number of feet in the air. And these are called the apple houses. And there are still apple houses that exist to this day. What they did um, is they, they hung a weapon, and then they built houses at one mile, two mile, three mile, four mile ring around it to see what, what would be the effect of a nuclear weapon on a, and these were good, these are stick-built houses that were built in the 50s. So these are good houses. What you're seeing here, not like today, <laughs> what you're seeing here is the thermal flash of the weapon. The weapon goes off, there's a thermal flash, you see that immediately. That's the thermal flash. Okay. This is the thermal flash burning the paint off the building. Okay. The blast wave hasn't hit it yet. Thermal ignites the paint, ignites the building. Boom! This is like two miles. That's the blast wave. <laughs> blast wave hits it. Ba boom! There's a positive blast wave, blows everything out. Then there's a negative blast wave, comes back and sucks everything back the other way. So if you're within that area, a uh, couple of miles, depending on the size of the weapon, some other characteristics, don't worry about it. You're dust in the upper atmosphere, so you're, you don't have anything to worry about. I don't think they're going to use one here. Cedar City isn't targeted. 
Los Angeles, Las Vegas, eh, actually the test site is targeted. So they don't really care about the casinos. The test site is targeted. We are downwinders, <laughs> if you want to know what that is. We are downwinders for the test site. Uh, so they definitely will target the test site. So that's what will happen out there. And then the fallout will come here. The good thing is you'll have hours before it comes here. So that's when you gather everybody inside. You said you do gardening. Cover your garden with tarps. Cover it because you do not want the radioactive material to fall into the soil. It will contaminate that soil. You'll end up replacing the first six inches of soil. Cover the garden with tarps. You have time to do that. Get the kids inside, build your little walls, fill your water jugs, sit tight, get the dog in, you know, things like that. So you'll have, you'll have time. I think you'll know. It'll probably be on CNN, so you'll know that that happened. Okay, what's fallout? All kinds of different isotopes in there. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot uh, of material out there. It is bigger than one micron, uh, so that's why the N95 works to filter it out. It's, it's, it's like dust is what it is. Um, uh, so the early fallout reaches the ground in the first 24 hours. Lots of energy. You must be inside before this stuff hits. This can kill you. You've got to be inside. Highest degree of fallout risk. The energy decreases quickly. Delayed fallout comes later on, and the stuff that's on the ground, and it comes, and you'll see this stuff arrive, fine particles, dust, sand, things like that. Lower radioactive energy, lower risk. Um, this is, now you know what numbers are. If you're in Las Vegas when it goes off, 1,000 R per hour. That's, you're dead. Boom, done. No, no problem. 480 R per hour, okay? What's the lethal dose? 450, you're dead. No problem. Two hours, don't be in Las Vegas. Now you see that it drops very, very quickly. And this is still in Las Vegas. It's, it started at 1,000. Now it's 480R per hour. Now it's 100R. And it's only, we're only seven hours. Dropping very, very quick. 14 hours, now down to 43. Okay. Now after 48 hours, down to 10R. So now there's that, that 10R, and this is outside. I want to be inside. I want to be maximum distance away from this. So very quickly it drops, but you have to be inside to protect yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm not even going to do it. Basically, maximum distance. It's called the inverse square law. Not worth it. Okay. Rule of seven. Every seven-fold increase in time, ten-fold decrease in exposure rate. Again, get away from it, stay inside, and the rates drop very, very quickly is what you want. Okay, how does the injury occur? Basically, it's energy, it damages living tissue, and can damage very quickly, and then eventually you end up with uh, leukemia, other cancers, and things like that. Um, this is a fairly low level at 50 and above. The people most at risk, children, pregnant women, um, they want to stay away from that stuff. This is an important um, item after an event. The faster that the people puke, the higher the dose that they received. So if the person goes three, four, five, six hours after the event, they haven't puked, they got a very small dose. Con other side, they puke within 30 minutes of the event. They, they receive probably a lethal dose. That's what happens is. So that's the difference is if you can, uh, if you can make sure that the people are inside, they're protected, and nobody's getting sick, Everybody's doing okay, that's a very good sign. Versus somebody who was out, they were caught out there, they received a high dose as they come in, you clean them off, and they start to puke immediately. Bad. Don't waste a lot of resources on that person. You can't do the blood test to determine, uh, it's called an absolute uh, lymphocyte count. Uh, that person is probably not gonna make it. They're gonna go like that, so not good. Um, you start to get the vomiting at they use the international scale of called grays. One gray is 100 rem. So this is 50 gray. Excuse me, 50, 50 rem is what it is. So here's where you start to get into, uh, okay, this is 500 R, but you can get other things before then. These are, some of these are just unbelievable uh, of rates that you would get very, very high. This is where the skin is just coming off, not good. Uh, but anyway, so just keep in mind, you start to get sick 500 to 100, excuse me, 50 to 100 REM, start to get sick. 
uh, you start to really have issues above 200, and the lethal dose is 450. Okay, what's the difference between an RDD and a nuclear weapon? That's a nuclear weapon. So that's about, that's, lot, that's actually a lot more than 15 kilotons. That's at the test site. You can see the mountains. That's the test site there when they used to do above ground blasts at the test site. Okay. Nuclear detonation, prompt radiation, activation fallouts, uh, and you're going to have fallout. This, it's a pipe bomb with some hazardous materials. It's what an RDD is. So it, no, no mushroom cloud, very small amounts of contamination, nothing big. Terrorists can use this. I mean, you could do this with hospital waste. Uh, you, you could have issues there. Okay. Strategies to protect yourself. I showed you the KI. So if you have little kids and, and you would need one of those packets for each kid, but, and then you read it and it has the dosing on the back to say if, if the child is this, this age or this weight, you give this. Very, very important to give quickly. You give this immediately because you want to flood the thyroid with potassium. You don't wait until fallout is here. The key is to get to flood the thyroid and you keep the bad stuff out and you're just flooding it. You're giving this every, I think it's 12 hours. Um, so that's what you want to do. Okay, uh, strategies, uh, time. Basically, don't stay near the source. If the source is outside, don't go outside. Distance, maximize your distance. Provide shielding. Showed you how to provide some shielding. Okay. Um, give this very, very quickly, preferably in the first hour. Uh, and in your case, you hear about an event in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, give it. Start flooding the thyroid because the stuff you give isn't going to hurt the child. It's going to protect the child from the other stuff that's coming. So it's ineffective after four hours. Uh, the government, I, I don't know what the, what the uh, health people will say here. I'm, I'm not sure what they'll say. But read, read the dosing. Um, I don't, because we don't have a nuclear power plant in Utah that I'm aware of. Um, they don't stockpile KI. In places where they have nuclear power plants, um, they stockpile it and they actually give it to the residents who live in the 10 mile ring. They have it at their house, and then they have huge stockpiles of it to give it to other people. But they don't do that here, uh, so that's why you have to buy it yourself. It's fairly cheap. It's ten or eleven, twelve dollars. It's not much. We can buy that here. You can buy it here. Uh, you, you, you've got Isostat here. Yeah. There are some other variations of the same the same product. So, but yeah, he's he's got it right here. The, the key on that is, as soon as an event occurs, how much does he have left? Zero, because <laughs> everybody's coming here and he's gone. He may he may have a hundred packs of it. It's gone. As I say, after Fukushima, they wanted 20 million unavailable because they wanted to do the kids. And they, and they were specifically doing children five and under because those are the ones who were at the greatest risk. And they, they, they issued what they could, and they didn't have nearly enough. That's why you'll see this. You'll see a spike five to ten years. So, um, so give it quickly. Okay, time. There's your source. Limit your time. So you only want to be close to it for a very short period of time. Maximize the distance. And this is saying at one meter, it's 100 R per hour. If you can go another meter out, it drops to 25, go another meter. So you're just going against the interior wall and providing some shielding to the outside because it's going to fall on your roof. So if you have a two-story home, don't use the second story. Use the first story. And you're basically um, trying to protect them from because it's going to lay on your roof and it's going to lay on, on the ground outside. And then use shielding. Uh, dense materials, whatever you have. You're not bringing dirt or sandbag into the house. You already have that. They're under the beds. They're under the table. They're under wherever. You're just going, I'm going to build a wall. It's fairly easy to do. Uh, it doesn't take anything. If you have kids of, you know, 10 years old, they can carry some of this stuff. It's fairly light. So you're good there. Okay, that's how you protect yourself. Time, distance, and shielding. Key points. Okay. Plan on being in your shelter minimum of three days. Minimum of three days. Uh, and you're waiting until local authorities have gone outside using meters and have scanned the ground and said, hey, it is down to less than one R per hour. And you can go outside. Because what will happen is they'll come back and they'll say, you can go outside for an hour today. Tomorrow, two hours. The next day, three hours. And they'll, they'll go like that because it'll start very short periods of time. Because they'll say, well, we understand you have to go outside to feed your animals or whatever it is. And that's what they'll say. They'll, they'll start and say, uh, we, we, do, we recommend no more than an hour today. And it, as the timeline goes, they'll say, now you can spend longer outside. But you still want, if you go outside, an N95. Protect yourself from the dust and everything else that's out there. Uh, I'm gonna, you know most of this, so I'm not going to waste a lot of time. You know what the type of training you need, individual level. 
first aid, communications, all the stuff that we're doing here. Family level, you work with the age appropriate, what you have, little kids. Teenagers can handle stuff, and then community. We still, you know, I always suggest cert team, volunteer fire department, EMS worker or whatever, so you get more knowledge, more skills, build that up. Okay, that's just a question of time <laughs> when the stock market goes. It's like, oh well, it's gonna happen. <laughs> now what happens, uh, banks shut down, ATMs run out of money, <laughs> so people can't get money, you know, the EBT card doesn't work, oh, that's not a good day. <laughs> that, that's not gonna be, a, you know, good. So you have to have a strategy, say, we need some cash and we need some other things, you know, to make, make this work. Okay, this is what happens. Large urban areas, they depend on that EBT card. If that EBT card doesn't work, I mean, you see this demonstrated all the time. The EBT card shuts down at Walmart and, and you have <laughs> huge issues when that happens. And that's just one little area. And I mean, they're all over the internet. And you're like, wow. <laughs> so don't live there. <laughs> Stay out of large areas. Consider alternative solutions if things go wrong and local law enforcement doesn't respond. That's when you need to say, we need to get together and uh, work something out. So yeah. Have a little checklist to set up your shelter. You know, first thing I should do, get everybody inside, lock the door, you know, does the shelter, am I building a shelter for protection from RAD, things like that, what am I doing? Um, don't become a victim, don't rush into something you don't understand, don't assume that the government is telling you the truth or the news media, and don't ever test anything because you can't check on any of this stuff. Without a meter, you're clueless, you don't know what's out there. Okay. Um, th that's my bottom line when I teach these courses is you are responsible for the safety of your family. FEMA is not, is not going to save you. Uh, if you didn't plan, then you're going to have a problem. And get your mindset squared away. Know what you need. Skill set, you build up your skills and then your tools. What do I have? I have meters, I have N95s, I have peppers, I have whatever you need. You need those. So that, that's a summary for the course. Did pretty good. So, sorry. <laughs> some, some stuff. Okay. Okay.